Hi, I'm Michael Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Iran-Saudi relations. Relations between these two countries, once sworn enemies, are improving. And that worries me. It worries me a lot. The United States and Israel should be seriously worried by the renewal of talks and the building of relationships between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The United States and Israel should be seriously concerned about China's involvement with Iran and Saudi Arabia. I'm worried, in fact so worried, that this newly burgeoning relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia literally sends shivers down my spine. Iran and Saudi Arabia, longtime nemeses, are expert gamers when it comes to international diplomacy. Saudi Arabia simultaneously engaged in diplomatic liaising with Iran and engaged in navigating a U.S. brokered deal between their country and Israel. And not just any deal. This would be a deal that includes the resolution of the decades old until now unsolvable Palestinian-Israeli issue. A deal which would presumably involve some form of Palestinian statehood or independence. Any diplomatic venture that includes Iran is extremely dangerous for Israel and for the region and for the world. Iran cannot be trusted. Iran is not a responsible party to any agreement. This is an axiom. It's essential to understand. The tensions that have existed between Iran and Saudi Arabia have been very important in keeping an equilibrium in the region. These two significant regional powers balanced one another their tensions kept them in check, and it staved off head-to-head -head confrontation between the region's Shiite, Iran, and Sunni, Saudi Arabia populations. Until now, they encouraged their proxies to battle it out. As a result, larger regional conflicts were minimized. That was then. Times have changed. Nowadays, the attraction of creating a working relationship with Iran has become very attractive to the Saudis. And while I'm not at all sure that this, until now, elusive goal will come to fruition, Iran and Saudi Arabia are both willing partners in the challenge of forging liaisons. A deal may backfire, and if that happens, it will cause great damage to the Saudi empire. As the leader of the Shiite world, Iran has nothing but disdain for all Sunnis even and especially towards Saudi Arabia, specifically because the leaders of Saudi Arabia are the leaders of the Sunni Muslim world. Shiites have been holding a grudge against the Sunnis for over 1400 years. The anger is visceral. The animosity will not dissipate or melt away with the signing of a piece of paper. It cannot erase a heritage of hatred that dates back to the period of Muhammad. A central issue in their conflict is the long-ago dispute over who should succeed the Prophet Muhammad. Also at issue are major disputes over the Quran and the Hadith. There have been public assassinations, there have been bloody massacres, there have even been a dispute over the death of Muhammad. Sunnis believe that he was poisoned by a Jewish woman. Shiites blame his two wives for the deadly deed. Iranian foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdul al Hayyan recently visited Riyadh. According to the press reports, their meetings were productive. His office reported that the meetings were a lead up to normalizing diplomatic relations between the two nations. This recent visit was a follow up. It was part two of face to face negotiations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Part one took place when, in June, Saudi Prince Faisal visited Tehran and met with Iranian leadership there. There is no love lost between these two countries. They have been on opposite sides of conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, etc. And most recent division came on January 3rd, 2016, when Saudi Arabia pulled their ambassador and closed their embassy in Iran. The move followed the January 2nd Saudi execution of a Saudi-born Shiite cleric named Sheikh Namir. In response, the Iranians rioted and burned the Saudi embassy in Tehran. And the previous year, during the Hajj in Mecca, located in Saudi Arabia, of course, a swelling stampede 
resulted in the deaths of over 2,000 Iranian Shiites who were making their pilgrimage. The Saudi prince blamed the Iranians and suggested barring them from future pilgrimages. This year, for the first time in eight years, Iranians were permitted to return and participate in the Hajj, the pilgrimage. It was a test that the Iranians passed with flying colors. And today the Saudis are hoping that Iran will endorse Riyadh's bid to host Expo 2030. Iran has many reasons for wanting to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia. And as important as access to the holy sites of Mecca and participation in the Hajj are, they don't top the list of reasons for Iran. Iran also wants religious superiority over the Sunnis. They want all Muslims to unite under their leadership, under Iranian leadership. Their ultimate goal is to oust Saudi Arabia as the leader of the Muslim world. Now, of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world today, 85% are Sunnis. 15% are Shiites. Under normal conditions, Iran would never become a leader of the Muslim world. Mending ties with Saudi Arabia is Iranians' leadership hopes to pave the path of achieving that goal. For Israel, the alliance may be disastrous. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from the Jerusalem Post that was written by Yaakov Katz and was published on August 3rd, 2023. The title of the column is Israel's Chief Rabbi Elections Tainted by Personal Interest Opinion. It's subtitled, Instead of Passing Laws that Help the People and the Nation, its members are focused on helping themselves, or in the case of the chief rabbinate, one of their brothers. This is an enormously insightful piece about Israeli corruption. It is especially poignant because it reveals how selfish and how self-motivated the behavior of certain Israeli politicians and leaders are. This is how Yaakov Katz begins. Arya Derry is one of the most well-known politicians in Israel, and his two criminal convictions are what Israel has to thank for the controversial law passed last week that annulled the Supreme Court's use of the reasonableness as grounds for disqualifying government decisions. What most Israelis do not know, though, is that Derry has an older brother, Yehuda, who currently serves as the chief rabbi of Be'er Sheva. And like his younger brother, the leader of the Shas party, Rabbi Derry from Be'er Sheva, is now also the recipient of a special law passed a few weeks ago just for him. An extension of the current chief rabbi's term so that the older brother, Derry, can potentially get the job next spring. A bit of background. Israel has two chief rabbis, one Ashkenazi and one Sephardi. They are usually elected to a term of 10 years. The current rabbis, Yitzhak Yosef and David Lau, David Lau, were supposed to step down at the end of the year. Under the current coalition agreement, two parties were supposed to put forward candidates. Betzal Smotrich's religious Zionist party received the Ashkenazi chief rabbi and Derry, the Swardi one. Katz now explains the real problem that Aryeh Derry must contend with and how he plans to solve the problem. Katz continues. Presumably, an easy split. The problem is that two people want the Sephardi chief rabbi role. One is Derry's older brother, Yehuda, and the other is David Yosef, the brother of the outgoing chief rabbi and son of Shas's late spiritual leader and founder, Rabbi Avadya Yosef. This puts Aryeh Derry in a bind. On the one hand, he has the opportunity to appoint his brother, but that would put him at odds with the Yosef family, his political patrons. So what did the Shas leader do? He had one of his party members legislate a law that postpones the chief rabbi election by six months until sometime next April. By then, Derry hopes he will find a way to get David Yosef elected chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and then clear the path for his older brother to become the country's chief rabbi. It's perfectly fine not to care about all this and to write it off as the price of any government will have to pay when sitting in the same coalition with the ultra-Orthodox. 
to most people who read this, the chief rabbinate plays absolutely no role in their lives. And if it ever does, it's almost exclusively negative. On the other hand, this is an illustration of all that is wrong with this government. Instead of passing laws that help the people and the nation, its members are focused on helping themselves, or in the case of the chief rabbinate, one of their brothers. If this is not a conflict of interest, I'm not sure what is one anymore. Yaakov Katz goes into detail with examples of other problems plaguing the Netanyahu government, especially laws surrounding the military draft, and then he points out Netanyahu is always giving interviews on the foreign TV networks. For his conclusion, Katz writes, Will these interviews help? Maybe, but they alone are not the solution. Israel has a deeper problem today in the United States, which is even 40 interviews cannot solve on their own. Thank you, Yaakov Katz. He's 100% correct. Things are getting a little ugly in Israel. Next up is a column by Arsen Ostrovsky. It was published on Ynet on August 19, 2023, and it's entitled, Princeton Must Stop Promoting Anti-Semitic Blood Libels, subtitled, Response to Ynet Report. If the university is genuine about its commitment to pursuit of truth and academic scholarship, it must remove a book from its curriculum that alleges Israel is harvesting organs from Palestinians. Opinion. The story is mind-boggling. Princeton University, one of the greatest in the world, is using a textbook that claims that the Israeli army deliberately maims and harvests the organs of Palestinians. This is not only patently untrue, it is absolutely absurd. This is how Ostrovsky begins. The charter of Princeton University, one of the oldest, the most prestigious universities in America, reaffirms that the central purpose of the university is the pursuit of truth, the discovery of new knowledge through scholarship and research. Yet inexplicably, the same institution of higher learning is now promoting the vile, anti-Semitic blood libel that Israel intentionally maims Palestinians and harvests their organs. This outrageous claim from a book titled The Right to Maim, authored by Professor Jasbir Puar, is set to be taught in the upcoming 2023-2024 course, The Healing Humanities, Decolonizing Trauma Studies from the Global South, to be led by Assistant Professor Satyal Larson of the Department of Near Eastern Studies. In the book, the author claims that Israel, and specifically the Israel Defense Forces, is intentionally seeks maintaining Palestinian populations as perpetually debilitated and yet alive as a form of biopolitical control. The author publisher, Duke University, adds supplementing its right to kill with what Puar calls the right to maim. The Israeli state relies on liberal frameworks of disability to obscure and enable the mass debilitation of Palestinian bodies. Ostrovsky now explains how wrong and illegal it is to use books like this, and the federal funds should be pulled from the university because they are a violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Ostrovsky writes, the use of such mendacious and demonizing allegations, as well as clear blood libels, is also a direction violation of widely accepted International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, working definition of anti-Semitism, and runs contrary to the May 2023 White House National Strategy to Counter Anti-Semitism, which singled out surging Jew hatred on campus, reiterating when Israel is singled out because of anti-Jewish hatred, that is anti-Semitism, that is unacceptable. Furthermore, as a recipient of federal funds, Princeton is also bound by its obligations under the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, including the prevention of hostile and discriminatory environments for students, such as the one that will inevitably be created as a result of the use of such anti-Semitic and inflammatory material as contained in the book, The Right to Maim. In conclusion, Ostrovsky explains that there is much that Princeton can do to fight anti-Semitism. Ostrovsky writes, in May 2021, Princeton President Christopher L. Eisgruber 
know that anti-Semitism has a long and ugly history in the world, in this country, and unfortunately at Princeton. And that, we must stand steadfastly against it. If Princeton truly seeks to stand steadfast against anti-Semitism in all its vitriolic and hateful manifestations, it will remove this book from its course curriculum and show that it is indeed one of the foremost places of learning in America and not a loudspeaker for anti-Semites and conspiracy theorists. It's important for us to know what our students must contend with on college campuses and so important for us to help them counter the hatred and the lies. Coming up next, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you seven memes, headlines, and cartoons today. The first meme comes from the Kfeller site. It is a fun take on how people deal with Jewish names, especially at Starbucks. It reads, POV, have a Jewish name and ordered coffee? And we see rows of coffee cups, which most certainly dumbfounded the servers. The first name is obviously Eviatar. On the Starbucks cup, it reads Avatar. Asher becomes Dasher. I yell it into I yell it. Talia is Talia. And my favorite is Miriam, which is Mary Yum. <laughs> Next up is a tweet that reads, it is the year 2032, you're driving on the highway to work in your Apple car when you hear the news that the new Apple car 2 is coming out. Suddenly the speed of your car goes from 95 to 25. Chaos ensues. This is so funny. It has happened to all of us. A new cell phone comes out and suddenly our old phones slow down. The next is a headline and it says so much about our society today. The headline reads, California store owner prices all items at $951 so thieves can be prosecuted. And then there are coupons at the front of the store that drop the price down to normal. I may have showed you this cartoon before, but it's worth seeing again. A man is filling his car with gas saying, I call it our electric vehicle because every time we fill it with gas, we're in for a shock. Gas prices are going up again. This next headline and news piece is from the Tampa Times, December 3rd, 1977. That's right, from 1977. The headline reads, Video Games Just a Passing Fad, Top Toy Company Executive Says. This is a doozy. They knew nothing. I read this next headline in all in Hebrew media all over the place, and then it made its way into the U.S. press. For those of you who missed it, here we go. Large Israeli snake dies after trying to eat a porcupine. It was a python, and it was a big mistake. Finally, this last piece is a tweet, which is a picture of a Google search. The search asks, how do I convert? And the prompt suggests to Judaism, to Islam, to Christianity, to PDF. And that's how PDF has become the fourth most popular religion. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. An Iranian Jew detained at Ben Gurion Airport on suspicion of espionage has been deported from Israel. It is Israel's Shin Bet that revealed both the arrest and the deportation. The agency stated that the subject, who has family ties in Israel, confessed to receiving assignments from Iranian security officials and coming to Israel for the purpose of carrying out certain tasks. Included in this task were covert information gathering and photography. During his interrogation, it was revealed that this Iranian Jew had met with Iranian security personnel and was briefed by them before his arrival in Israel. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has fired many of the Palestinian Authority's district heads, including those in Jenin, Nablus, Kalkilia, Tulkarim, Bethlehem, Hebron or Hebron, and Jericho. The officials were taken by surprise by the move, one saying he learned about his sacking from the media. Abbas is cleaning house, and Abbas is punishing those who have been disloyal to him. El Al, Israel Airlines, 
is in serious, quote, talks with the French plane maker Airbus to buy as many as 30 A321's Neojets. El Al CEO explained that the purchase would be a historic change of the supplier as El Al looks to replace its short haul fleet. Israel's flag carrier is also in talks with their traditional supplier Boeing to buy the 737 MAX aircraft. On the sidelines of a conference during which El Al issued quarterly results, Dina Bental Ganeshia, the Israeli airline CEO, spoke to Reuters about how El Al is celebrating 20 years of being traded on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange after privatization. The El Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, terrorist organization, which is affiliated with Fatah's military wing, took responsibility for the terror attack in Mount Hebron that killed a 40-year-old Batsheva Nagari, a kindergarten teacher and mother of three, who was a passenger in the car belonging to a neighbor who was critically wounded. Also in the car was Batsheva's younger daughter. The terrorist organization said in the statement, this operation comes as a natural response to the occupation's crimes and arrogance. EU ambassador to Israel, Demeter Sanchev, condemned the drive-by attack. On the social media platform X, which was formerly Twitter, the ambassador wrote, deeply saddened by another terror attack in the West Bank that claimed the life of an Israeli woman and left a man injured. Condolences to the loved ones of the victim and wishes of speedy recovery to the injured. The EU strongly condemns terrorism and violence against civilians. An Iranian military delegation visited Moscow to discuss cooperation between Iranian and Russian ground forces. This news came to us courtesy of the Russian state news agency TASS, which cited Russia's defense ministry. Russia and Iran, both under Western economic sanctions, have forged closer relations in military and other areas since Moscow sent tens of thousands of its troops into Ukraine. The West has accused Iran of selling Russia large numbers of drones for the use against Ukraine, something Tehran, by the way, totally denies. According to a report from Axios, U.S. President Joe Biden is considering meeting with Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, on the sidelines of the G20 summit to be held in September in New Delhi. A meeting between Biden and bin Salman could give a boost to the talks the White House is having with Saudi Arabia on an agreement that includes security guarantees from Washington to Riyadh and normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel according to the news website. So follow that on Axios. Iranian assets that had been frozen in South Korea were transferred to Switzerland's central bank for exchange and transferred to Iran. South Korea media group Yanhap Infomax reported, citing an unnamed currency market source. According to the report, the Swiss National Bank's plan is to exchange six billion holdings in yuan which is, of course, the South Korean currency, for dollars and then euros in the currency market, converting about 300 billion won, which is 223 million, to 400 billion each day for five weeks. As background, Iran and the United States reached an agreement under which five U.S. citizens detained in Iran would be released, while Iranian assets in South Korea would be unfrozen and sent to an account in Qatar that Iran could access. Israeli man escaped an angry Palestinian mob after he entered a Palestinian village by mistake. His car was torched, but it was local residents there who helped him escape. The IDF said troops also assisted him in escaping. An Israeli foreign ministry official said that there is no basis for threats made by Ukraine's envoy to Israel, that Israelis would be prevented from making their annual trip to Uman to visit a burial site of Hasidic rabbi Rebbe Nachman of Bratzlav, which has become an annual tradition for thousands of Israelis. The foreign ministry statement came in response to a statement by Ukrainian ambassador Yevgen Kornichuk, who said that Kyiv would stop bilateral visa waivers and the agreements because Israel was blocking Ukrainians from entering 
Israel. Iran's foreign ministry has summoned the Swedish and Danish charge de affairs to Tehran over the desecration of Korans. The official of Erna in news agency reported all of this. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and Iranian President Ephraim Raisi will meet in New York in September to discuss issues, Iran's nuclear program especially. Kyodo news agency of Japan issued this news report quoting unnamed Iranian diplomatic sources. According to Kyodo report, Iran aims to promote relations with Japan, which is traditionally a friendly nation to them, to avoid international isolation as Iran's talks with the United States and Europe over their nuclear deal have stalled. Israel's strategic affairs minister, Ron Dermer, indicated that he does not rule out the possibility of Israel allowing Saudi Arabia to develop a civilian nuclear program as part of a normalization agreement. In an interview with PBS, Dermer, a former Israeli ambassador to the United States said, they could go to China or they could go to France tomorrow and ask them to set up a civilian nuclear program and allow for domestic enrichment. So the question that I ask myself is, if the U.S. is involved in this, what will it mean 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road? And what's the alternative? We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. One of the memes I showed you demonstrated how people bastardize some Hebrew names. We've spoken in the past about names, but there is still so much to say about names and Hebrew names and traditional names. Most people don't know the meaning of their names or where or even what language their name comes from. I often ask people I meet what their name means, and when they all, almost always have no idea, I go ahead and tell them what their names mean. This Starbucks meme was very funny, even more so because it was Starbucks. The name Starbucks has a great story. The three co-founders of Starbucks were Gordon Boker, Jerry Baldwin, and Jeff Siegel. Their ad advisor said to them, select a name with ST at the beginning because it's a very strong sounding sound. They took an old mining map and boom, they saw Starbo. Gordon Boker, whose name in Hebrew, by the way, means morning, shouted Starbuck, who was a character in Moby Dick. He was Captain Ahab's first mate on the Pequod. That is how the name was chosen. And they thought of maybe using the ship's name Pequod, but they quickly realized how funny a cup of pea cub would sound, and they ditched the name quickly. All Hebrew names have meaning. All classical names have meaning. They're often lost in the English. The difference between John, J-O-H-N, and J-O-N, for example, is not just an H. They are two different names with two different meanings. John with an H is from Yohanan, which means God will have compassion. John without the H is from Yonatan, which means God gave us a present. Many parents, I'm sure, choose the spelling they prefer not realizing the blessing they were giving their children in choosing their name. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.